。金老师让我简单的介绍一下安格教授，我就是他是，呃，可能大家也比较了解他了，呃，呃，他是哈佛大学法学院的庞德法理学讲座。这个庞德是一个非常有名的，呃，他他曾经担任过法哈佛法学院院长，好像三十多年。他是一九三三零年代，他还是中国国民政府那个顾问，法律顾问，一九三零年代，最以他,他庞德命名的这个讲座是哈佛法学院最高的一个法律学讲座。但他其实远远不只是一个学者，因为他是来自于巴西，他还是巴西公民。但他在哈佛留学的时候非常成功，他也是哈佛的一个奇迹。他二十八岁当了哈佛大学法学院的正教授，在法国历史上还没有，因为二十八岁当了正教授还没有。但是他的远远不止在书斋里面那么，所以卢拉总统呃担任就是当选以后，就请他回巴西，他当当了两年的叫做战略事务部长。但是战略事务部其实原来巴西政府里没有，是卢拉专门给他，给他建的。那么这个部我觉得没没有那么实，但他有的要发改委的那种研究功能，我觉得更像国务院发展中心。我觉得并没有那么实，但我确实很像国务院发展中心。呃，那么，但是明年就是因为明年又是巴西大选，那么他比较支持的一个政治家，我估计也是由戈米斯也会，但是我们都不能确定，但是我觉得还。还是也可以，如果有希望当选的话，他在明年以后可能在巴西的政治上会发挥更大作用。那么等他担任战略事务部长两次，就是卢拉一次，卢那个罗塞夫他又任命他一次，他当过两届。这段期间和呃金砖五国的这些活动，他都代表巴西政府的一个具体的谈谈判的主持者，他主要是和代表国。实际上，那个上海的金砖五国那个新发展银行，实际上他和代表国最早提出了这个建议，呃。那么他的其实兴趣非常广，还包括最新的著作，也是宇宙学家，就和宇宙李斯莫林，他可以，他这个观点觉得认为就是我们现在觉得社会科学都要学自、呃、数学物理，但是他是认为数学物理这个实际上要更像社会科学、生物学，就是要把真正的实际的因素，你比如宇宙大爆炸这些，你怎么理解到还就是这物理学的规律也有时间性，那么他他是把这颠倒过来，那么这呃，那么他。来上个礼拜天，就这个礼拜就是，就礼拜天了。晚上来以后，这个礼拜一就让中央党校做了一个报告，他主要讲这个叫做 inclusive vanguardism， 就包容性的先锋主义。他觉得当前世界各国，就是那个最先进的知识经济的领域，他但他还是一个孤岛。比如说美国就是硅谷，但是在这个硅谷之外，在这个在硅谷里面的一系列新的社会，因为硅谷它不仅是个高科技，而它是估计很多新的生产关系。比如说，它那个网络性的生产，而且每个企业内部等级没有原来那么强。比如这些，它还是一个先进先进的生产方式，但是一个孤岛，它怎么能把它扩展？那么他觉得他在党校那边，我觉得比较有意思。后来前天和昨天在清华讲了两次，他提出的就是说，就当前的一个思路，主要很多需要做是还是一种需求侧的民主化，就需求的民主化。他比如说，就是他是什么意思呢？比如说一种意思就是，比如次贷危机。当时很多美国很多消费者买房子都不用，呃，都不用首付，但他在某种他也是一种需求侧民主化，就是他他让更多的人在需求方面能够有并更平等的参与，但他认为跟需求民主化实际上会，虽然有一方面有必要，但是有方面会产生严重的问题，比如巴西，他认为就是由于消就是消费提前发展的过快，这个加上出口商品这个。这个高涨的时候，他们有一个不成过早的去工业化，这是巴西的问题。那么，所以他说更重要的是一个供给侧的民主化。什么叫供给侧民主化？实际上，你就包括中小企业的发展，中小企业融资的能力，也包括风险投资。因为风险投资，他认为在西方本身也还是很少的。比如美国的投资里边，真正风险投资的占的额度是很少的。那么，大部分投资还是来自于企业本身自己的流利。那么，他就说供给侧的经济民主化是包括。这个实际上需要制度创新，所以他提出就是供给侧结构性改革。后来我跟他开玩笑说，来党校还开玩笑，我说你这个不成了习近平的新时期中国特色社会主义，因为习近平一直，习近平主席一直提提倡供给侧改革。后来很多人把他的理解为供给侧改革就是里边经济学。后来习主席又说不是里边经济学，说因为我们是供给侧结构性改革。所以，我所以，我就说他这个习近平的这个思路，我也许来说的有没。Provide more content to President Xi Jinping's thought on social, uh, 
socialism with the Chinese characteristics in a new year. <laughs> okay, so this is just a simple introduction. Yes, sir. This is a very 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 simple introduction. 他可能就是他想做一下听大家的意见，做一个座谈，他可能讲二十分钟。对，他想先先讲一下，然后请这里做个评论，然后大家。Well, my my proposal is that instead of speaking. Compactly mm -hmm. and making a speech mm -hmm. at a single time, we go by steps. Okay. And uh, I make a few comments at each step, mm -hmm. and then we have a discussion. Okay. If you agree with that. Okay. So the the. The four steps that I imagine are these, as a, a, a proposal for the organization of our discussion. Uh, the first step is to provide a brief explanation of our, pre our present situation in Brazil, and in particular our economic situation, how we got to our present position, uh, and why we face, why and how we face a crisis. 他说他第一个先，第一第一个步骤，他先讲一下巴西的现在的经济情况，为什么他们目前遇到这个危机。The second step is how many of us think now in Brazil we need to redirect our strategy of national development. This redirection then interests us in. Reshaping the nature of our relation to China. The second is to talk about the Brazilian discussion, the policy discussion, that is, how Brazil is going to get out of the crisis. In this discussion, Brazil and China's relationship is how. The third step is then to discuss the agenda of the possible collaborations between China and Brazil, both practical and. Conceptual or doctrinal. The third step is to discuss the agenda of the possible collaborations between China and Brazil, both practical and conceptual. The fourth step is to discuss the agenda of the possible collaborations between China and Brazil, both practical and conceptual. And the fourth step is to discuss what we might do together toward a change in the global order. The fifth step is to discuss how we might work together to change the global order. Both within and outside the BRICS movement. 就即使在金砖金砖五国之内，也在金砖五国之外，就改变这个秩序。So if you agree with this proposal, I would go ahead and make some brief comments about each of these four steps. 他说，如果大家同意的话，他就按照这四个步骤来讨论。OK。但他每个步骤完了以后，大家就先讨论一下他的意思。Now, in the recent historical period. Over the last, the last approximately 20 years, we had a model of development with two bases. The first basis was the massification of consumption, the creation of a market in mass consumption goods based on an elevation of popular income, of popular purchasing power. And the second basis was the production and export of commodities, agricultural, ranching, and mining products. Brazil suffered a relative deindustrialization, and our commodities financed urban consumption. That is, they funded the first basis of development, mass consumption. 他说：“那个巴西经济当前的困境呢，来自于两个，一个是过去的大量的这个大众消费有一个有点超前的那种升级，第二个就是说巴西主要依赖的
这个初级的产品的出口，就是农业，就是大豆啊，那个矿物产品、铁矿石啊这些。Uh, and uh, in this period, China overtook the United States as our major market. We began to export to China the relatively untransformed products of nature and to receive in turn from China everything that human intelligence had touched. <coughs> 中国已经超越了美国，成为巴西的最大的贸易伙伴。那在这过程当中，巴西主要出击这种原原产品，原产品就是实际上是一个自然自然界的产品，而从中国那接收了就是人类的智慧所创造的产品。Uh, now this strategy of development worked so long as the commodity prices were up on high. When the commodity prices began to collapse. The government then attempted to give an artificial afterlife to this failed model of development by forced public spending, by what we call vulgar Keynesianism. He said the Bashi government, but he just gave this. 就是商品，大宗商品出口价格下降这种已经失败的模型，但他们给的人为的就是人工呼吸一样的 after life， 人工呼吸，还有用一种，它叫做庸俗凯恩斯主义的，就是方法，就是扩大公共支出啊什么，但这是一种庸俗的凯恩斯主义办法。And that worked for a while, but it ended up disorganizing public finance and aggravating the subsequent crisis. 就就是这种。庸俗的凯恩斯主义，就是他意思，并不是。其实严格来说，也不是凯恩斯本人的。但是庸俗的凯恩主义，他也就是人工呼吸一样维持，又使这个这个模型，巴西的发展模式又维持了。但实际上，这个危机还是不可避免的。Uh, in this circumstance of economic failure, the president, uh, President Rousseff, was removed from office, and a, a group of people came to power, who. Uh, Adopted as their central program, the economic ideas that prevailed in Brazil and in much of the Western Hemisphere in the 1980s and 1990s, the doctrine of financial confidence. We would do everything that the capital markets wanted, in the hope that by winning financial confidence, we would gain investment, and investment produce growth. 那个，他就说这就是那个卢卢卢塞夫总统被弹劾的那个背景，因为他弹劾的时候，就是因为他所谓因为这个庸俗凯恩斯主义加大公共支出，他是把这个去明年的财政支出把今年就支出了，因为这是他那个被弹劾的理由。那么这个他被弹劾以后，新的总统，呃，这帮人的思路就是要尊重那个 finance， 就是尊重那个什么，就是各种国际投资者、华尔街的人，他们，但他们就是因为相就是相信说，你只要。让有一个财政财务的信息，呃 ，financial financial investor confidence， 就投资者的信心以后呢，好像经济就自然能发展。就是他说现在的这个人的巴西的去弹劾以后的人的观点。Of course, this hasn't worked, as it hasn't worked anywhere in the world.、Uh, and the result is that the country now finds itself disoriented and in search. Of an alternative model of development. But this kind of only let investors have faith, the economy will naturally develop. This kind of is actually not possible to be successful. And in any place, not only in Brazil, it is not possible to rely on the investors' faith to naturally develop. So now, Brazil is looking for a new way. So that's my first set of comments. Okay. Do you want to discuss? Well, if, if you would like to discuss, yeah. other, because the next set of comments would then. Be to、uh, outline in general terms、yeah. what many of us think we need to do next. Yeah. Okay. 他说他现在就可以讨论他第一步，他第一个部分就完了，就巴西现在危机的原因。和，那咱咱先可以讨论一下。这个先，他这个整个议题的模式变了，就是我就先先先讨论一下，然后大家就一块讨论吧，不不再总体说的有一个评论什么。就是我我也想谈一下，就是我对这个。
唐格尔教授这个侧面的了解。呃，为什么这个就是魏老师这次请他来呢？我也是非常积极的这个在那个群里面推广。因为实际上就是在五年前，我就这个看到他写的一本书，书名叫《这个重新想象的自由贸易》。那我当时就觉得这个学者这个反思精神特别强，就是说，他认为现现有的这个国际的这种不平衡，在很大程度上是源自于咱们受这个比较优势这个理论的长期束缚。但是要突破这个理论本身呢，就是要有更大的想象空间。那么他他，但是他提的这个计划是比较比较比较庞大的。就他的用他的那个话来说，叫做这种新的一个，这个一种新的智识，智识智慧的智，识是见识的识，就是说，在这整体的这个思想界和在国际经济结构界，要有一种新的，特别是给发展中国家有新的新的自由。所以当时这个理论就就引起我比较多的多的关注，然后这个书我也读的比较很细。那么实际上，我就感觉，就刚才说的巴西的这个这个情况，实际上和他那本书里面指出来的情况是很接近的。因为他讲的巴西的困境，实际上是来源于更多依赖他在自然禀赋方面的分工。他通过这个出口这个矿产品，然后能够维系他比较高的消费水平。但是呢，他没有打破。这种自然禀赋或者比较优势赋予它的分工，所以当农产品价格下降了之后呢，啊，没有这种弹性和适应性，维持它原来的这种这种宏宏观经济的状况。那么实际上，我感觉这个安格尔教授刚才说的这个巴西现在陷入困境的这个局面，我理解，如果说和他原来的理论相呼应的话，那么实际上也是反映了就是原有的。这种国际分工，或者说是这种国国际分工的理论，给发展中国家造成了一种一种困境。大概就是很简单的原因。Shall I proceed to come? Ah, Professor, I agree with you that uh, uh, strict uh, fiscal discipline will not uh, solve all the problems. <coughs> But I think it's a precondition for the stable uh, macroeconomy. Uh, I would uh, give you two, uh, some numbers. Uh, in the past half century, the accumulated inflation in Brazil is uh, $172 trillion. 172 trillion. I think that uh, the other number of the uh, uh, billion million. Uh, but uh, in in Japan, the same number uh, is 3.1 in the past half century. Uh, the reason behind this uh, hyperinflation is. Uh, uh, and uh, overexpenditure in the uh, uh, pu pu public expenditure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my observation. So, so I, I, I did not, in my brief remarks, criticize fiscal discipline. I criticized the doctrine of financial confidence. They're two <coughs> different things. Uh, and let me explain. Uh, I myself. I'm an advocate of rigid fiscal discipline. But for the reason that is opposite to the doctrine of financial confidence. So the doctrine of financial confidence is, is do whatever private finance wants. Serve its interests and its whims in the hope of attracting capital. I think that we need to have strict fiscal discipline for the inverse reason, not to placate the financial markets, but so as not to depend on them. So I am an advocate of strict fiscal discipline so that the state will have a shield 
behind which it can initiate a rebellious strategy of national development. And I believe that this imperative of creating the conditions for rebellion, for national rebellion, trumps the uh, reasons for Keynesian countercyclical management of the economy. A conventional Keynesian would say, when there is an economic slump, spend in order to raise the level of economic activity. But this view disregards the primacy of the strategic imperative of being able to initiate a strategy of development that does not suit the interests and ideas of the financial markets. So in the short term, uh, there can be a confusion or a superficial convergence between the neoliberal view of fiscal discipline and this view that seeks to prioritize the goal of national rebellion. But in the medium and long term, the difference of motivation is decisive to the definition of the path. Physical 但他和这个理由是相反的重大的战略领域当中，就国家那个进行新的发展，这个以development的initiative就是新的发展的这个创意的这种能力。所所以它要财务纪律，但是它是和一个相反的原因，和金融市场息息相反的原因。So so just to explain a little further, why do we need to maintain a large level of reserves? so that we are able to say no, so that we are not obligated to do what international finance wants us to do. So then if, if uh, you allow me, I would go on to the second set of comments. The first set of comments is just a background. So we are scheduled to have a national election uh, and the election of the new president in October of 2018. And in this run-up to, to the national election, we begin a debate about the reorientation of our national development strategy. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, central positions in this debate that uh, has increasing influence in the country is the view that we must now reorient our development from the demand side of the economy to the supply side of the economy. We must go from being a low-wage, low-productivity economy to being a high-wage and high-productivity economy. And instead of simply democratizing the economy on the demand side, as we did in the recent historical period, we must also seek to equip it and democratize it on the supply side. 
重点从那个需求侧改革转向供给侧改革，这和我们有很多的。那么这里关键就刚才我开始说的，一开始我记得他他现在又说了一遍，就是说在供给侧的民主化，就供给侧的经济民主化。So and there is a fundamental asymmetry between democratizing demand and changing supply. The, dem the democratization of the economy on the demand side can be done just with money. The democratization of the economy on the supply side requires structural change and institutional innovation. And therefore, it requires as well ideas. He says there is a basic contradiction, that is, in the demand side, it is only need to pay money. But in the demand side, it is need to change the structural and structural change. So uh, now I have to explain a little more than I did in my first set of comments about what has happened to us. So in the middle of the 20th century, uh, we established in Brazil uh, an industrial system in the southeast of the country, and a system that uh, can be described in the predominant terminology as Fordist mass production, <coughs> the large-scale production of standardized goods and services with relatively rigid machines and production processes, semi-skilled labor, and very hierarchical and specialized Work relations. 嗯，那么他就是说，在本世纪中叶，一九六零年以后，那么巴西在东南部建立了现代的工业，但这种工业基本就是福特主义式的工业，就是有大批量生产标准化的产品，以那个比较半技能、三 S 级有半技能的工人和工作场所的组织非常等级化的这样一种福特主义的生产方式，在一九六零年代的巴西建立起来。So this system of industrial production achieved a high standard of quality, but it became vulnerable to attack from two directions. On the one hand, it was vulnerable to the appearance of other countries that could always provide labor at a cheaper price. And on the other hand, it became vulnerable to the emergence of advanced manufacturing and what we call more generally the knowledge economy. Knowledge intensive, flexible, post for this production in the major economies of the world. It was caught in a pincer movement between low wage regressive production and the uh, high wage, knowledge dense and technology dense production. But he said that the West Coast of 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 the West 第二个危险是说，在那个知识经济代表的先进制造业的对他们的冲击。So uh, in that period, instead of facing the challenge of changing our economy on the supply side, <coughs> we succumb to the temptation of finding the easy way out, which was to rely increasingly. On the production and export of commodities. <coughs> So, um, <coughs> we experienced the premature de-industrialization that I described before, 
And at the same time, we underwent a denationalization of the residual industrial apparatus. To a large extent, the remaining industrial apparatus was acquired by foreigners. Now I want to make a further set of remarks about, about the, larger, the larger global background to these Brazilian events. So there is now a, uh, a new advanced practice of production that we sometimes call the knowledge economy. And it is present not only in industry as advanced manufacturing, but also in every sector of the economy, in knowledge intensive services and in precision scientific agriculture. But in each sector, it appears as a fringe, as an insular vanguard that excludes the vast majority of the labor force. Knowledge so, to my mind, this insularity of the advanced practice and production, its confinement to fringes that exclude the majority of the labor force, is the most important cause of economic stagnation and of massive economic inequality in all the major economies of the world. 他认为在世界所有的主要的经济体量中，最主要的就是说，其现在目前面临的经济停滞和经济不平等加剧的最主要原因，就是这种先进的知识生产都都还是个孤岛。And there is no clear example in the whole world of a widely disseminated or inclusive form of the knowledge economy of the advanced practice of production. We can't look to any country in the world and say, that's an example of what we need to do. Let's follow the example. So on the one hand, we have in Brazil the declining mass production industries, uh, shrinking in their scope and increasingly denationalized. And on the other hand, we have a vast economic periphery of small business, especially small family business, pushed back to a technological and organizational rearguard, primitive, low productivity economic activity. So Basimutin困境就是说,传统的佛特主大工业正在萎缩,并且大量的被外国人买走了,同时在这个萎缩的传统佛特主大工业周围有大量的那种传统的家庭中小企业,他们也处于一种非常艰难的状态之中。So there is our task. We have to transform this vast economic periphery. The Brazilian economy has tremendous vitality. There's a, there are a multitude of hundreds of thousands of small businesses. And there is a new entrepreneurial middle class coming from below, from the lowest reaches of society, with a culture of self-help and initiative. But they lack the instruments and the opportunities both economic and educational, to progress toward high productivity 
economic action. Uh, and this circumstance of national failure and national abdication is expressed in the structure of our trade with China, as I earlier described. China is not the cause, but China is the expression of the circumstance that I described. 就是说巴西当前这个困境也在中国和巴西的贸易结果中反映出来了他认为巴西的困境中国不是巴西困境的原因但是中巴贸易确实反映了巴西的困境 So uh, it is it would be unacceptable for the Brazilians in the next historical stage to have with China a relation that they regard as neo-colonial. So either we find a way to work with China in the structural transformation of our economy, or we become more distant from China, commercially and politically. Uh, and that then is the bridge to what I intend as my third set of comments. Mm -hmm. But before I go on to them, I, 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 I'd like to hear you. Paul 实际上对外资的开放呢它是有一定限制的所以这个是一个方面大规模的投资所谓三驾马车等等等等
Of course. Of course. So uh, you're entirely right that uh, one of the many conditions for the creation of a strong alternative is the deepening of domestic finance. So the South American republics in general in the closing decades of the 20th century uh, accepted a series of policies that tolerated a very low level of national saving, both public and private, and a corresponding reliance on foreign capital. Uh, and this circumstance, as I suggested before in our earlier conversation about fiscal discipline, tied the hands of the state. It put us on our knees. Uh, and this uh, circumstance of being on our knees was regarded by the Brazilian elites not as a problem, but as a solution.这个自由工业体系的起来工作政治的其实比中国的那个货币制度还差很多就是它其实是严格限制的东西的就它因为这个限制所以你那个整个起来几个产业没有像其他产业扩散我觉得这两个原因肯定比那个就是现在这个贸易贸易现象反出来的原因是更本质的原因。So uh, I don't entirely agree with you if, if I understand your comments. Uh, we do have to change our labor laws and the organization of our labor market. Uh, but I remind you that in the high period of industrialization uh, in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, uh, we had all of these labor rights. And nevertheless, we had a prosperous, vibrant industrial system. Of 
course, the neoliberal idea around the world is that uh, economic stagnation can be reversed simply by eroding the rights of workers uh, under the euphemistic label flexibility. Uh, and the result has been to condemn an increasing part of the labor force in every major economy of the world to precarious employment. So we now have this phenomenon of workers who are unprotected by the law. There is a minority of workers in Brazil who are highly protected, but the majority have no protection. 40% of the labor force is in the informal economy, and in the formal economy, an increasing percentage is condemned to precarious employment. Uh, we cannot hope to sustain a dynamic of radical innovation without imposing an upward tilt to the returns to labor. <音><音><音><音><音><音><音> 比如说我们的这个打车软件 I, I also disagree with this. <laughs> so the, the predecessor of the now most advanced practice of production was mechanized manufacturing and subsequently industrial mass production, which we call Fordist mass production. And by its very nature, it had a specially close association with one sector of the economy, industry. Nevertheless, every part of the economy, including agriculture, was eventually transformed on the model of mechanized manufacturing. Now we have in the world a, an advanced practice of production, knowledge-intensive, flexible production that should in principle be susceptible to even more rapid and universal dissemination. But the opposite happens. Instead of being disseminated, it's confined. To my mind, there's nothing natural about this situation. It is an enigma. And uh, the beginning of an explanation can be found in the very demanding preconditions of the knowledge economy. It's educational preconditions, it's social moral preconditions, and it's institutional preconditions. So take the example of education. Classical development economics pays lip service to the importance of education. But the truth is that in Fordist mass production, 
the workers barely need to be educated. They need only three things. First, they need the disposition to obey, conformity, in a command and control structure. Second, they need elementary literacy and numeracy. And third, they need physical dexterity, especially hand-eye coordination. That's all they need. They don't really need to be educated. But uh, in this new advanced practice of production, they do need to be educated. The old advanced practice of production required only a very low level of trust and discretion among the participants in the process of production. The new advanced practice of production requires a higher level of trust and discretion, uh, a revolution in the moral culture of production. Uh, and the third set of characteristics is that it seems that this dissemination of the knowledge economy cannot happen without innovation in the institutional arrangements of the market economy. New forms of decentralized strategic coordination between the state and private firms, and new ways in which the private firms can cooperate and compete simultaneously. And all of this involves a reinvention of the market economy and not simply a regulation of the market economy. 我来简单翻译一下,就是他说其实他们两个的问题,有一个关键的问题就是说知识经营,他们两个都认为就知识经营的本质就是他就是有一定的孤岛性,因为知识经营本来就是先进的他就不能就是就是说所以这个病是不能
。这真正的知识和信息创新一定是主导，但是他用什么渠道来连接打通才是关键。他刚才说的是找到打通的机制，并没有说知识天生就应该是。不对，但不他他他没有说是光这不是就 OK。So, so, so, this, this grid is some debate, you want some debate. This is the key for spread of knowledge and power. It's the mechanism of learning by doing. And, which, very important. and this actually, according to the president of the South American Bank, who visited here also, this is also the, the lack of product change. Production. Because the knowledge is spread this way. Of course. Yes. So he agreed. Of course. So, but, uh, so the, the knowledge economy is already present in every sector. It's not confined to advanced manufacturing. It exists in services, and it exists in agriculture. And indeed, under this economic paradigm, the very distinction among sectors is attenuated. Because, in a sense, advanced manufacturing consists in crystallized intellectual services. But uh, uh, let me not give the impression that I think that there's an easy solution. Uh, on the contrary. Uh, what I believe is that we confront a, a formidable dilemma that uh, I want to describe in the following terms. Uh, conventional Fordist mass production, conventional industrialization, is no longer reliable as the route to broad-based economic growth. That's why we look for an alternative. The alternative would be a more inclusive form of the now most advanced practice of production, knowledge-intensive, flexible production. But no one in the world knows how to do it. So the situation, as I understand it, not just in our countries, but in the whole world, is that the received route to economic growth, conventional industrialization, is blocked. And the alternative to it, the inclusive form of the knowledge economy, seems to be inaccessible. If it hasn't been achieved, even in the most advanced economies of the world, with the most educated populations, how can we expect to achieve it under the conditions of a developing country. That's the dilemma. And uh, my thesis, my polemical and programmatic thesis at this moment in our conversation is that the dilemma can be broken only on the second side. There's no way of saving conventional industrialization as a route to economic growth. We somehow have to find a way to make the inaccessible, the inclusive form of the knowledge economy, accessible by breaking it up into parts or pieces or steps, as you suggested in your remarks about the product chains. So although you seem to disagree with me, I agree with you. <laughs> 就是他就是说现在最主要的悖论就是不仅在巴西而在所有国家发展中的大国都是那种传统的福特主义工业化的已经不是一个可行的那个方式了<laughs> so I, I, I don't know, we would then come to the third step of the remarks. So, so now we come to the, to, the, to the question of Brazil and China. So I said, uh, this circumstance in which we find ourselves in Brazil is mirrored in the structure of our trade with China, which increasingly appears to us as uh, 
threatening to be a, a neo-colonial relation that confirms us in the, in the circumstance of economic regret. And we then want to find another way to relate to China. Now, it seems to me, uh, right at the outset, there are two major dimensions. So, one dimension is to what extent and in what way can we partner with China in uh, reindustrializing our country on another basis. That is, it's not simply the return to the previous form of